So we have two fabulous speakers coming up next. Uh, we have Matthew Hoy, Matrix, and, <laughs> and Davo. Um, they're going to be talking about smartphone security and privacy. Uh, for those of you not in this room, there's also a lockpicking village presentation. Uh, and plenty of contests still going on, vendors and sponsors. I think you guys kind of know the deal by now. Yep. Yeah? Okay, good. Well, please enjoy this talk and give them a big round of applause. All right. So let's get this thing started. About me, uh, I'm Matrix on Twitter. I have fancy security alphabets for security certs, whatnot, and I prefer Scotch from Scotland. About David. <laughs> hey everyone. Uh, so Twitter, uh, Delta Flyer Zero. Uh, I, right now I'm on a Japanese whiskey kick, so if you want to talk Japanese whiskey, come chat with me after the talk, and uh, a nice cat pick I have. All right, so you probably want to know what this talk is going to be about. I'm going to go ahead and just preface it like this. I'm not going to talk about reversing hardware. I'm not going to be talking about playing with the code. I'm not going to be talking about anything that deep. The purpose of this talk is actually to go ahead and look at things that we're doing in our everyday lives as far as not securing our devices. And this is here to go ahead and I'm going to kill this. And this talk is here to go ahead and help you take your privacy back and secure your devices. So this is for the general public. And this is going to go ahead and cover a couple of the devices that are major, iOS and, of course, Android. And we're going to talk about how to go ahead and dump uh, things that might have been on your phone previously, as well as David will be talking about the iOS uh, Android privacy granularity, and I'll be pretty much covering that. So things we're going to cover, it's important that you think about what cloud are you using? What carrier are you on? What apps are you actually using? We'll talk about the advances in security for mobile devices and a lot of the recent fails. Uh, he thinks it's all the user's fault. Do you trust your device? Uh, when you get your device, what do you actually go ahead and do with it? Uh, yes, we have the shrink wrap. We go ahead cut open the shrink wrap, basically, how do you know that your device has not been tampered with before you went ahead and, and, and got it? Uh, there's also a big issue where we know that SIM cards have issues with security. Who would have thunk it? So no matter what type of device I get, I can't actually guarantee the security due to the fact that we have issues with the SIM cards. And of course, happening. So, David, why don't you take it from here? All right. So, uh, I just want to take a moment to uh, go over the built-in granularity that iOS has built in as of iOS 8. And this includes location services, contacts, well, everything on that list. It would take too long to actually go through it all. But uh, they've actually broken out the privacy for what can access what into these categories. And um, it only asks you if, if it can use this feature when the app tries to use the feature. So this isn't an at install issue. This is, this is a, OK, the app is now trying to access your photos. It will now ask you, can I access your photos? And then you can always say no. And if the app just, uh, you know, the app just has to deal with it for one, because Apple says it does. And if you feel that you need that functionality later, you can just easily go in and turn it back on uh, after the fact. Um, and then they've gone one step further for location uh, settings. And they've actually given you an option. You have never, I never want this app to ever know where I am. It's while using the app, which is only when the app is on the screen. And this is important. And then there's always, which even if the app isn't actively running, it can still know your location. For all the other settings, it's just on and off. So easy, mom can do it. <laughs> so, uh, Matt? Sure. Uh, basically, no matter what device you're using, 
Uh, your device has the potential to go ahead and spy on you. Uh, how do they do it? Uh, there's a location history in both iOS as well as Android devices. Uh, for iOS, you can go ahead and turn off the iCloud and, of course, use the privacy and the uh, location usage. Uh, you can also go ahead and mess with them and reset your unique identifier, which is the advertising ID. As far as the granularity and privacy as far as Android, unless I root that device, I'm actually not going to be able to turn things on and off. Uh, the only way that I can go ahead and do this is to either mess with the Android code using Android SDK and removing items out of the manifest, which this talk isn't for people who probably would know how to go ahead and do this, who has time for this. The problem is, is I have to sideload every app after rebuilding it and the apps probably might not work if they're upgrades and can possibly not be upgraded. So that's that. As far as how Google spies on you, same as Siri. Uh, it's voice and audio. So every time you do the OK Google or Hey Siri, it actually is sending it to the cloud. And they're trying to go ahead and learn about your particular habits. Uh, you will have search history and web searches, YouTube. And this applies on both devices. As long as you're using Google as a cloud, it doesn't matter if you're using an iPad. It doesn't matter if you're using Android. And it doesn't matter if you're using a Chrome browser. All these things are actually kind of turned on by default. And you all need to go ahead and make sure that you look at it and actually understand and turn off these settings. And this is more of the heart of the talk as far as what we're talking about on privacy. Uh, inside of the Android app, you have an applications drawer. We will get to that more. So Google spies on you, and it's pretty, pretty creepy because it has a history of everything, and mine's clean. But if you actually don't bother to go ahead and go into your history, you can actually go ahead and Google location history and search history, and you will see things as far as everything about your account you need to go ahead and grab that back because by default, everything is on. So I'm watching YouTube. I want to watch cat videos because I like cats. Well, it's going to remember every damn cat that I saw. So the other thing is, is ever since I switched to iOS 8, I'm not being a fanboy or anything, it's awesome because now I've used Google Maps and because I actually went ahead and limited the Google Maps app to only when I use it, it forgot where I am. It doesn't know where I am. When I was using my Android device, I thought it was pretty cool because I travel a lot for work. And I kind of liked to frequent places, and I forgot where I went. And I could just go into this history thing. Where was I last night? Oh, it's that restaurant. I want to go back there. Now that I went ahead and turned all that stuff off, I don't need the convenience of them remembering. I'll figure it out where I was last night somehow. A recent article came up in which they were saying, you do not want to go ahead and sell your Android device to anyone because apparently the Android device, if it is not properly encrypted, happens to have a persistence to it. So you'll see at the bottom there, I actually had a Motorola Zoom. I gave that thing away, but it's always going to remain in my accounts because I nuked the encrypted device. Fortunately, you can't piece it back together because it had FDE in there, but that's always going to sit there in my Google account until it just decides to go away on its own. Uh, when you are selling a device, when you do go ahead and switch clouds and everything else, make sure you go ahead and remove your accounts specifically from devices on the web interface, as well as fully encrypt your device and then go ahead and run a nuke. Because the difficulty is, is there's persistent bits that stick around and, well, 
the only way you're going to go ahead and secure that Android device is FTE, then wipe. So I'm going to let David go ahead and illustrate some of the nice settings in iOS. So um, lots of arrows here. <laughs> but um, so on, on iOS, if you want to limit uh, what, an app, what uh, apps have access to, you go into the settings, you click the little marker called privacy right there, and then you figure out what exactly you want to check on, say location services, and then it gives you a nice list that shows you every single app that has ever asked to use locations. And you can, and this is where uh, I was talking about earlier, where you can tell it, um, like for example, the App Store can never tell where I am because why does the App Store need to ever know where I am? <laughs> and um, same goes for AT&T Scanner. Um, the camera, I actually, I actually like to know uh, where I took the pictures, but then I'm not sending pictures to anyone. So um, just be aware that your camera does save your location when you <laughs> take a uh, picture on an iPhone, unless you turn this off. So if you're trying to be sneaky, uh, just make sure this is turned off before you take the picture. Uh, on uh, Android, on the other hand, um, well, we went hunting for it, and... Uh, Maybe it was in apps, um, and uh, okay, okay. So a list of apps, and and you know that that's great. We we got we got our app store and our Astro file manager and Authenticator. That that's good. Okay. So what kind of permissions does it have? Okay, let's see here. Uh, this may cost you money. Why can it? Why can this read my text messages? And this has been brought up in a lot of talks before, but Google doesn't seem to really care about. Um, about uh, granularity in security. Why does my uh, photo app need to be able to uh, record audio? You know, I'm not exactly sure. It's only supposed to be displaying photos. This is a question for the app developer, who, which in the end has all of the permission to basically request whatever permissions it wants. And you will only be asked once about this, and that is when you install the application. Or update. Or update it if the permissions have changed. And often what they do is, often what, what, what has happened when you actually install an app is, it seems pretty innocuous when you get the version one. So I end up getting a app. It's version one. I look at the manifest and it's like, okay, yeah, this app is supposed to go ahead and access my text messages because it's like a text message messaging thing. Maybe I might want it to go ahead and access photos. So I initially agree because it's like it's saying, I only want to access your photos and the ability to send SMS, MMS. I'm cool with that. All of a sudden, two weeks later, Google Play, update. And then it has a whole damn manifest in there. And it's like what I was cool with the other time before is not necessarily the case now because now it wants access to my GPS. It wants access to my contacts. What what does it need access to all that stuff for? And uh, and the other thing is that like like Matt was saying earlier, you can modify the manifest and tell it no, you don't have access to this, and then sideload the app. But now you're getting to this whole thing where the app won't update itself. So you, every time a new version of the app comes out, you will have to go and make that same change and then sideload it again. And uh, that time that where you're not up to date, as we all know, can be a serious security problem. Getting back to the the whole the whole uh, issue we were talking about earlier. So other considerations that you have to go ahead and do when you're selecting a uh, actual mobile device, just because I bought an iPhone doesn't necessarily mean that I have to use iCloud as my cloud. I actually don't. The only thing that I have turned on on there is uh, find my iPhone. You don't have to turn every damn thing on, and you don't have to go ahead and, and uh, give it all those direct accesses. I actually use Google uh, for most of my apps and most of my cloud 
on the actual iPhone because I was an Android user before. But the cool thing is, is all of a sudden, I can actually tell the apps now, no, I don't want you to go ahead and access these things because I can do it a checkbox by checkbox. So I have the best of all the Android apps that I used to have. And I don't have the all or nothing that unfortunately Android goes ahead and pushes on me. So Google, I use their cloud. iCloud, I don't use it except for find my iPhone. And Microsoft has actually been doing some pretty decent advances as far as their cloud with the 365 drive as well as the Outlook app. And I also like Box because uh, they've actually gone ahead and integrated the biometrics into my Box account for my fingerprint reader. And I think that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so those are things that I go ahead and take into consideration because when you look at specific clouds, uh, Box is actually uh, SAS Type 2, which is equivalent to banking cloud storage. So I actually kind of like it, and it's pretty, pretty decently done. So every time you go ahead and store something uh, into the cloud, you should actually be mindful of which cloud you're actually putting it on, because otherwise you get other things happening. As far as as far as uh, phones, phones are cool. But what carrier are on you? What carrier are you on? Uh, recently, the Verizon people actually finally caved in and allowed you to go ahead and opt out of the super cookie because most of the privacy activists went ahead and basically hammered the crap out of their customer service. I did too, and I'm actually quite happy that. I can opt out now on Verizon. AT&T is still unknown as far as the super cookie tracking. And T-Mobile, unknown, as well as Sprint. If anybody knows, it'd be awesome. But I haven't seen anything in their EULAs or anything to go ahead and allow you to go ahead and opt out of that uh, super cookie. So even if they are going ahead and looking at your traffic, you don't have to go ahead and play along and play along willingly and nicely. Better things for going ahead and using privacy is make sure that you go ahead and get yourself a VPN. Uh, how many people are actually on the Wi-Fi at this hotel right now? How many people are actually tunneling their, their traffic? Those are smart people, but you have to go ahead and think about this as far as my mobile carrier. Why should I go ahead and trust them? They're no better than anybody else, and if you can go ahead and encapsulate and tunnel all your traffic, it's much better that way. So my, my choices are, I actually have two favorite VPNs. Ace VPN, which uh, is really, really dirty, and I can't actually use it to actually com complete consumer transactions because they're just blacklisted everywhere, but it's awesome for pen testing. And recently I've been using... Uh, private internet access, which is pretty cool. You can go ahead and take any gift card and pay the 49 bucks for your annual fee and pretty anonymously do things. So, and David? Yeah, so uh, my current VPN of choice, though, is uh, Viper B VPN. And explain why. It's, uh, it's not quite as, uh, I guess, secure as, or I guess, uh, you're, you're not trying to hide your personal information with this. Uh, that you have a VPN or that you are paying for VPN. This is more for ease of use. It is a fast and um, reasonably secure VPN that is uh, basically getting you through whatever your net whatever network you're in and to straight into you know the the clued without having to worry about your carrier or or uh, whatever Wi-Fi you're on and. Um, and because it has a fancy app and it's very easy to use, you know, mom can use it and it's very reliable and it's fast enough to stream Netflix through it. So uh, it's uh, basically, hey, I just want to be safe in my communications. 
Yeah, so what apps should you be using? So uh, there are a couple of apps uh, that uh, have been uh, really good with security lately. And um, these are apps that you should absolutely have or at least check out. Um, Signal is uh, very good. It connects to, what was it the Red Phone? Red yes, phone? Red yeah. Phone and Secure Text. It's yeah. the Moxie Marlin Spike uh, version for iOS. So what it is is it uses the Open Whisper. It uses the Open Whisper uh, system so that you actually have end-to-end -end encryption for each phone. If I call him on his phone or he calls me, it actually has authentication just like the black phone does. Uh, so there are two keywords. I say one, he says one, and they better match or I've been middled. So Signal is actually free for iOS. It's been around for the Android platform under, under uh, Red Phone and Secure Text for quite a long time. And it was funny because I actually had the same number that I ported over from my Android phone to the, to the iOS, and it actually said, oh, I've seen this phone number before, before so it was relatively painless to go ahead and do. Uh, I've been playing with an app called Purio. It is basically an encryption method which uses PGP, uh, which has a public and private key, but what they've gone ahead and done is they've actually made it so it's just as easy as logging into Google. It gives you a passphrase and it allows multi-factor authentication. When I'm actually texting back and forth, I know that there's been both a public key and a private key. Uh, I currently don't have the app yet. I've been waiting for it, but I actually went ahead and saw it on somebody else's device and it looks very, very promising. For password management, uh, I've evaluated Strip. It's a simple tool to remember important passwords and it syncs with Box, Dropbox, and OneDrive. So some of the clouds that are there, I can go ahead and trust and it'll keep my passwords relatively secure. It generates random passwords. It's pretty good. Um, for Android, for my password management, I still will use Open Intent. It's pretty good, the OI password. So those are apps that I would go ahead and use. Uh, as far as uh, a nice new app that came out is a brilliant idea. It's called Burner. And what it does is it's actually Google Central on steroids. I can go ahead, and this is not for you to go ahead and actually use to basically do legal things with, but it's nice when I want to go ahead and, like, I want to go ahead and sell something on Craigslist or I want to buy a car or I want to buy a house. Uh, what Burner allows me to do is buy a number that is burnable, buy minutes, buy text, and... It allows me to go ahead and have a virtual number which runs my phone, sends text to my phones, but the number dies after 30 days. So if I'm in the market to go buy a car, usually I'm going to buy the car, and then all these advertisers and marketers are going to get a hold of my phone number. And with this, as soon as I buy the car, you just hit burn and the number is gone forever and I don't really have to deal with these people ever again. So. When doing privacy, you have to go ahead and consider who you're giving information to just as well as who you're entrusting your data to in the cloud. Uh, as far as if you are using iOS with another iOS person, iMessage seems to be pissing off the feds recently. So if they're not happy, I think I'll continue to use the thing. So. <laughs> All right, so... I'm going to let David talk about the iOS, the encryption. And I've been talking. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, so as far as advance, advances in smartphone security, um, one really great thing about uh, recent iOS is that it is doing hardware encryption whether you want it or not. Uh, it's built into the uh, device itself, and it, yeah, it works with as little as a four-pin 
key. And, um, well, the four-pin key itself is... Uh, what was that device that uh, it uh, kept cutting the power? They could keep trying over and over again. Yeah, don't don't use a four pin key. But uh, your your data itself is encrypted out of the box, which is fantastic. And um, with uh, the newer devices, it it is uh, full device encryption. There's actually no excuse if you have a newer device like the sixes to not use a passphrase or a password because you can actually use your your fingerprint, and speaking, you know, of uh, things like that, Android has attempted with their Lollipop release to go ahead and provide the full device, full device encryption. One of the things that drove me absolutely batshit about uh, dealing with Android and the full device encryption is I turn on my phone and a minute and a half later, it finally unspooled itself and decrypted itself. So it's software-based, but it gives me full device encryption, including an SD card, but none of the phones seem to be coming with an SD card because they want to sell you a more expensive phone. So More GBs. Yeah, exactly. But is it gold? Mine's gold. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, as far as encryption, it must be a good thing because, once again, it's pissing off the government. The other thing is, is they kind of lied in the implementation of the, the Android Lollipop. They were going to say that when you got the device out of the box, it's going to be encrypted. You actually have to go into your security settings and enable that after you've set a password, after you've set a PIN. So it's not exactly automatic. You actually have to be thoughtful about going in there. So. If you do have an Android device, please check your security settings because you don't have full device encryption turned on unless it's specifically you see the Android doing the encryption dance and that's it. So we'll go ahead and talk about fails. Uh, encryption is not enabled out of the box. Uh, iOS gives you the encryption out of the box, but unfortunately, it gives you a four-digit pin. Four-digit pins are not good. Uh, there's absolutely no reason to go ahead and use one once again because of the actual fingerprint readers in modern-day phones. Oh, another fail. Well, if I have an S6 through an S5, the fingerprints actually were accessible via apps and unfortunately were not encrypted. So... I don't necessarily know if I'm going to go ahead and trust my fingerprints to that device. Uh, it looks like I'm picking on Android. There are actually uh, 1,228 vulnerable applications in, in Android uh, as far as the freak vulnerability. Uh, yes, that also is about probably about 200 apps in the app store for iOS. So iOS does not actually have its clean security either. It had a failure recently. Uh, the Wi-Fi denial of service attack, basically, you get within range of a Wi-Fi signal. It basically causes your phone to go into a constant reboot until you can actually run away or drive away for enough miles so you can actually get control of your phone to make it stop rebooting itself. And then the most biggest, biggest fail. We were talking about this as far as, should I get a black phone? Should I get a Blackberry? Should I get this? Should I get that? Well, it doesn't really matter because we just found out that all the SIM cards, everybody has the encryption as far as nation states. And uh, SIM cards by themselves are compromised. So that's carrying your data in motion. And honestly, when you're going to get popped, it's all about the data in motion these days. So, come on, David. You have it in you. <laughs> okay. it in you. Oh, my God. Where do I even start? You guys, this is your fault. And, and I think more, more any 
anybody that is here at this conference, it is t- completely your fault that this is happening. We are not educating our people about their security. We are letting them buy phones and devices and these things that they put all of their information in. And it's not secure. And all of their information is getting spread everywhere. And you know what? They don't care. And they don't care because they don't understand what they are what they are losing, what they are giving up. So how could you let this happen? Professionals in the computer security field and general public, how could you give them all of this information and let them just do whatever they want with it and just throw it everywhere and put it on all these clouds and and all these devices that, that anybody can get to and be malicious with? So this is all your fault and... <laughs> Yeah, so please, oh please, start talking to people about their security. I know you are, but we need to step it up a notch because it is getting to the point where it is too late almost to step back and get our security back in line and educate the general public about their privacy. And speaking of that, it's always amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm traveling all the time, and people will actually – go ahead and pocket their wallet, but they'll leave their actual smartphone unlocked and at the bar. It's like, mind watching my stuff? They'll take everything else. It's like, you know what you have on your phone? Because that could be pretty cool. <laughs> so I've actually used this as, as, as a chance to go ahead and talk to people because sometimes I'll go ahead and be a dick and shoulder surf and go, yeah, you really shouldn't use that four-digit pin. <laughs> uh, and then they usually go ahead, and, and what happens when I go ahead and suggest something? They actually go, well, why should I do it? It's like, because all I have to do is look at the smudge prints on your screen, and I bet you these are your four numbers. And they go, well, how did you know that? And it's like, it's just obvious. So you need to go ahead and it is a teachable moment for folks that actually don't know any better as far as their security. And as security professionals, we should be teaching these people. We should be talking about this. And I thought that this was a good place to actually go ahead and talk about this. So we could go ahead and deal with it on a consumer level instead of actually going into the bits or the hardware or anything else. Uh, so. We'll go into the, 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 the compromise solution. It was actually mentioned in the Verizon DBIR report that to this date they have detected absolute no breaches caused by any mobile devices. Well, at least they haven't seen them. And then we have the paranoid conclusion, which is, hey, what I'm protecting against and what this whole talk about is, is is grabbing back your data as a consumer, making sure that you don't go ahead and, uh, and uh, basically throw everything ridiculously on the cloud and everything else. But if you're super paranoid, hey, one, don't piss off a nation state. Two, probably don't want to use a smartphone. Uh, but... There are things that can be done as far as, you know, dealing with the consumer thing. If you're on iOS 8, you can definitely go ahead and limit your exposure. Uh, If you're running Android, one of the other ways that you can go ahead and bring back granularity and app control is Excel Ops. The only hesitation that I have about using Excel Ops is I have to root the damn phone to make it work. And what happens if I accidentally leave my Wi-Fi on and that thing is rooted? I'm done. So I don't like the fact that I have to go ahead and disable a security thing just to go ahead and grab back some type of security. They need to go ahead and fix that as far as Android. We were going to go ahead and talk about and evaluate other specific specific phones like the Windows phone and other things, but we just didn't have a whole ton of time to go ahead and do that, but it looks like we've powered through all the slides and we've got time, so uh, BlackBerry still affords you that scalability as far as every single app 
you can go ahead and lock it down. Uh, location can be locked down. Uh, contacts can be locked down, except for one problem. There aren't a whole hell of a lot of apps for BlackBerry that I find useful. So if I don't have apps, what's the point of actually having a smartphone? Because I can't get anything done. So we'll see what's actually going to come up within the horizon and uh, the future. But David's right. It's our fault. Uh, we as security practitioners, we as developers, actually owe the people some type of accountability into how we develop the apps and putting things together. And uh, David, closing comments, final thoughts? <laughs> well. I have to say is uh, right now, so the, the title of this talk was uh, Smartphone Security for the General Public. And so right now, as it stands, if my, if my mom comes and asks me, what phone should I get? I'm going to tell her to get an iPhone. And then I'm going to go over that iPhone and, and go through the uh, security settings and turn everything off and show her how to do it. Um, I just am appalled at the total lack of care that Android has right now for for these permissions and um, that's basically something that Google has to address and they've been told to address this multiple times but I guess they just really don't want to take a look at it and uh, and do it and the weird thing is that I do remember having an Android phone at one time that had these permissions but uh, that was in 4.4 but, but that, that poof, right poofed out of existence. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Anyway, so do we have any questions? Oh, my. <laughs> Dan? Uh, the thing that you really, really want in Android exists in Lollipop. Uh, do you have the I, device? I left it in the room. So, so oh, when, did that, when did that come out? Uh, whenever Lollipop came out? Uh, I have a, the uh, 5.1... Uh, device that is running stock Android. We didn't. We didn't find any trace of that. Uh, it, so um, let let let's talk. Let's. Yeah. Oh yeah. Actually, CyanogenMod does have it. <laughs> Again, you're rooted. Like, Congratulations. Like no, this is a one plus. This came stock this way. Oh. oh. Don't buy your phone from a vendor. Buy it from somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One. Add that to the talk. One. Yeah. One plus one. You so said. One plus comes that way. Perfect. So, uh, we recommend a OnePlus. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I saw... Um, were there? Yeah. So, can you guys speculate why Google won't tackle it? I'm going I'm to say it's... I, I can't speculate why. I just know that this has been an issue. Uh, when Gingerbread and I think it's Jelly Bean 4.4, in between those transitions... Uh, they actually had it as a hidden menu option where you could go into each app and, and actually turn these things on and off. And then right between like uh, Jelly Bean and then the next edition, those menus just disappear. Yeah. And um, I, I'd like to speculate though. Um, I think that it was breaking too many apps. I think they got rid of it because either it was too difficult to implement effectively with the Android framework or it was breaking apps because if you if you go the rooted path and you and you turn these permissions off, a lot of times what happens is the app will launch and then immediately crash <laughs> with the with the permission disabled. Uh, where uh, with uh, iOS, uh, in order to get into the App Store, uh, you, you need to you need to make sure that if that setting is turned off, it doesn't crash. So um, th there is that. The One Plus, uh, which are the two Cyanogen Mod stock phones that I know of. Pretty much every other phone is coming from my carrier or from a manufacturer. Um, and on every single one of these devices I've seen, the carrier and the manufacturer have root. Like, I don't, but they do. Um, so I can choose what cloud I'm on, and I can choose to disable my Verizon Super Cookie, but I have two people whose security record is met who have root on my phone. <laughs> that, um, we we uh, just brush on it. I think in a few words in in the in the uh, presentation, but uh, that comes back to the: Do you trust what you're getting? And the answer in this case is no. I mean, uh, with uh, with the Nexus devices, you know, you can pull an image directly from Google, and then you know, I if I trust what's coming from Google, then I'm good. With ones that come from your carrier, 
I mean, they're so spotty with updates, and you don't know how they've modified it, and it's it's just a complete mess. And even if you want to, um, if you want to reinstall the OS from scratch, you know, it's uh, basically a crapshoot whether you can even do that. And then you're back to the I don't trust what I'm being given part. So at best, when I deal with an Android out of the box, what I can go ahead and do is wipe caches, wipe everything else, do factory reset. Maybe do it a few times and hope that it's good. Actually, the, another reason why I actually have started to like the Apple device more is they have this thing. It's called DFU mode. DFU mode actually allows you to see a signed uh, version of the OS. And what it essentially does is, at the hardware level, I'm no genius, but Jonathan Zdarsky went ahead and figured out that, hey, every time I do a DFU, it actually wipes the device clean and goes through the entire, the entire device and writes over it because it's basically erasing it and throwing I the, the... I think it's just killing the AES key. It's killing a key. It's doing all kinds of things. Basically, if you go ahead and DFU thing four times... Whatever was on it, if it was shrink-wrapped or TAO'd, uh, it's not there anymore. So I recommend that you do that to your device off the bat. I mean, I'm not even talking about TAO. Like, just popping up on my friend's phone and it's got Moto Care. You know, <laughs> that's... Uh... Or, or, or the NFL app. Because yeah. <laughs> we all need the NFL app. <laughs> Uh, tailored access operations, which is the basic stone revelation that people were playing with things that got into things that were shrink wrapped. So you intercept the thing before it goes to the store, and then you put it in the store, and then your target buys it. So the other thing is, is if you are buying consumer grade laptops and everything else, you should wipe those things because. Lenovo just proved that anyways in the fact that they had spyware in their OS. That's just awesome. So that's what that is. Anybody else? Going once. Going twice. And sold. All right.